My name is Dave Hahn. Welcome to the lovely Venetian Theater. If you look around you, you can see why I'm tempted to uh, prepare a magic trick. So uh, we are here today for uh, episode four of A Day in the Life of a Netflix Engineer. Good afternoon. To those of you that went to uh, Midnight Madness, good morning. So uh, my job today is to take you on an interesting little tour around some of the things that make your Netflix experience work. So one of the easy things to start with is to give you an idea of the pieces that make that up, kind of a large block architecture. So your Netflix experience, as you can see on the television there on the left, is primarily made up of two large technologies. Amazon Web Services, who's heard of AWS before? Oh, come on now. The jokes don't get any better than that, so you're gonna have to work with me. So we do a lot of AWS. The other part of your experience is made up by the Netflix Open Connect CDN. All the video bits that you see and some of those things that make up your UI come from, uh, come from Open Connect. So let's start with the AWS side of things. Netflix runs from three AWS regions in the world, US West 2, EU West 1, and uh, US East 1. We also have these uh, set up in such a way to where we can serve any customer in any part of the world from any one of those regions at any time. So that means all of the databases are replicated, all of the caches are live and hot, all of the services that need to be there to take care of those customers are up and running all the time in those three Amazon regions. If we dig into how those regions are put together, they look kind of like this. You'll see there at the front door we use the uh, Elastic Load Balancing Service. Everything that you do as part of your Netflix experience comes in through the front door of either a CLB or an NLB. Behind that, we have Zool. Zool is our layer seven business intelligent proxy gateway that allows us to do lots of really cool and interesting things with traffic as it comes in the front door. Our mid-tier services are pretty much what you'd expect. They're made up of EC2 instances running inside of auto scaling groups. And then we have that fleet of little robots, that's Titus. Titus is our uh, container instrumentation and management platform. So for instance, if you have uh, one of those uh, mobile phones that a few people are using now, if you've ever used Netflix from there, uh, you've actually talked to our container platform. We also run a lot of persistent services because surprisingly, it takes a good amount of data to run a little video streaming service. So we run those on EC2 instances as well as some of the RDS services. And then behind that, we have kind of a traditional, typical collection of batch services and online processing and algorithmic work and corporate work and those kinds of things. But that's kind of how the regions are laid out and what they look at on the inside. So if we dive in there just a little bit more, those ELBs that I talked about, so those are the front door for everything. And uh, there's a few conversations going on with Netflix at any given time. So we run hundreds of ELBs. Um, and most of those ELBs are running at millions of RPS all the time. Even if we just look for the streaming service itself, nothing else that Netflix does, there's millions of RPS coming across the, uh, the ELBs just for the streaming service. Same thing internally, we have some internal load balancers. Same thing, millions of RPS in order to make up your Netflix experience. If we move on to Zool, that uh, layer seven cloud gateway intelligent proxy. It also is running millions of RPS all the time and actually a little bit more so than the edge because in those different regions, those Zool proxies will spend time talking to each other. Some other interesting things that we do is we run, last I checked, a little over 80 million concurrent WebSocket connections through those Zool systems and they're running about 50,000 messages per second across those uh, WebSocket connections. And the team responsible for this does all of that work all the time without problem, with high reliability, with only around 3,500 EC2 instances globally. It does some other fun stuff for us beyond just kind of that proxy idea. Zool casts some retry magic for us. You see, as your device talks in and talks to Zool, it's going to proxy along that request. Now it will monitor what's going on with that request and what it expects to have happen when. And if things aren't behaving as Zool thinks it should be behaving, it will start making decisions like automatically retrying that request without having to wait for that to get all the way back to the device for that timeout to happen at the far end before that connection is retried. Also because uh, Zool is so intelligent about the things that make Netflix work, 
when those things start to happen, like retries or problems take place, it can start changing those requests on behalf of our customers so that we maintain that quality of customer, uh, quality of customer experience. We also do some of that cross-region magic with Zool. Perhaps some of you before have heard of our region evacuation exercises. If you think about those three AWS regions, I mentioned I can serve a customer from any one of those regions at any given time. One of the reasons we want to be able to do that is if there is a problem in a region, I don't want my customers to have to stay there while we figure out what it is. So we can evacuate in a matter of a few minutes all of our customer traffic out of one of those AWS regions and into one of the other ones. And Zool is part of that magic. Now to make sure that all of those mechanics work, we practice at least two or three times a month doing this regional evacuation. If you're a typical Netflix user, there's a good chance that while you were watching something or using our UI or playing with the application, we were throwing your traffic around the world just to make sure that all of the other pieces that need to be there, all of the scaling and all of the operations and all of the caches and all of the databases were behaving as we expected them to. And again, we get some other neat features. Intelligent rate limiting. Rate limiting is difficult and complex on its own at a network level. Zool gives us the advantage in that it knows more about those requests and what the expected behavior and typical behaviors are so that by the time we can decide we need to instantiate some rate limiting, we're much more sure that we need to do that and we're much more specific about what's being rate limited. If we move on to Titus as we move through our, our, regional, um, our regional description there, Titus is our container orchestration and management system. It uh, currently launches and manages around 3 million containers a week. There's something interesting about that. The work that those containers are doing are about 50-50 mixed between online talking to our customers and either offline or batch work. And one thing that I think that's interesting is that Titus is able to so easily manage and take care of and guarantee those different types of uh, work to these different customers doing different things without it having to be a load on their customers. I can submit jobs or I can make a request through the Netflix application, I get exactly what I need. Some of those containers run for less than a second, others run for days at a time, with most running for about minutes to hours. Which also means that on top of that mix of uh, batch and online, there's a lot of churn going on that the system also has to manage. It's managing those resources and keeping its promises to each one of those containers for the jobs that it needs to run. And then when it comes to scaling up, when more requests come in, the system can uh, launch those new containers in less than 10 seconds. Most of the time, it's a single, uh, single second uh, latency for getting a new container up and running and working. Let's move on to persistence. Netflix stores a little bit of data. To give you an idea, if we look at just what we do for our Cassandra clusters, we have hundreds of petabytes of data stored across thousands of clusters made up of tens of thousands of nodes that are all running hundreds of thousands of CPU cores in total. Some other fun persistence facts uh, are for our non-durable data stores, uh, most of those run for less than a millisecond latency, and our durable data stores are less than 10 millisecond latency. Uh, currently, they run tens of millions of operations per second across those different kinds of data stores. And currently, we store somewhere in the trillions of data records. Now, we have a few different storage engines that we use for this. I mentioned Cassandra earlier. We also use Elasticsearch. We have Dynamite, which is our sharded version of Redis, EVCache, which is our sharded MemcacheD, CockroachDB, Kafka, Rocks. Uh, we also use uh, MySQL, Postgres, and Aurora as part, of the, uh, as part of the RDS family. And of course, the world's most popular, most used database system, S3. I told you they wouldn't get better. So there's a little look at the uh, large architecture of AWS. Let's go down a little bit and talk about OpenConnect. OpenConnect is a uh, purpose-built CDN, built, maintained, and run by Netflix. So let's take a look at the pieces that make that up. So it's made up primarily of what we call Open Connect appliances or OCAs. These are highly optimized machines whose single job is to get bits off the storage and out the network card as fast as possible. 
There's not a lot of other processing. There's not a lot of other software. Those are the jobs of these devices. And to make sure that we get the appropriate bits flowing at the appropriate rate, we'll use both uh, uh, hard disk drives, we'll use SSDs and flash storage, and we'll put the appropriate data on the different kinds of storage based on how popular that data is for where that OCA is located. These boxes also, each one will run 100 gigabit networking connections, and we have them optimized to where we can get about 93, 94 of those gigabits as TLS encoded video traffic. Primarily, these machines are made with FreeBSD and NGINX, and if you'd like to learn more about how to build your own, you can check openconnect.netflix.com. There's not secret sauce in here that we, that, that we feel the need that we need to keep away from people, so we share a lot about how we make this work. So those Open Connect appliances are pretty impressive on their own, but one of them wouldn't really do the job too well, so we have to have a stack of them. So we'll put a lot of these things together along with the appropriate networking and routing equipment into what we call a stack, and then that stack will serve traffic. To give you an idea, this particular stack, the way it's designed, if it ran at full tilt, um, could route and manage about 1% of global internet traffic. So again, that's pretty impressive, right? But if I had one of these, what if that one is really far away from you? It's not a great answer either. So we built a lot of these stacks and we put them in internet exchanges around the world. And you can see from these yellow dots, that's where these stacks are currently located. And in those internet exchanges, we can peer with other networks, and now these boxes are closer. So that's better, but it's still not really good. If you imagine for me with a minute the uh, amount of data that you need to broadcast 4K UHD data across the internet. You need good bandwidth, you need solid bandwidth, you need consistent bandwidth. Now, placing in the IXs helps, right? But there's a bit better that we could do. So we took that additional step, and we will install these stacks of OCA appliances inside of your ISP's network. So that means that when you're streaming those video bits to your device and to your eyeballs, you don't even have to leave your ISP's private network to get that data. So that means there are a number of hops closer to you, your distance is shorter, you're not going to have to go through a congested drain point, right? All of those kinds of things that can cause a pause in that traffic. So this gives you an idea in the red dots, ISPs around the world where we've installed these stacks of Open Connect appliances inside the ISP. Now, there's one other thing you need if you're gonna run a network like this. You need a backbone. There's a couple of important things have to happen. We have to be able to manage these systems. There are thousands upon thousands of them out there in the world. We also need them to be able to update their data. We call that a fill. And we need to be able to fill that um, fill that device without impacting the ISP or the other devices around it that may be serving content. So we built our own global, uh, global backbone for running these appliances. And it's a, it's a nice animated map there. You can get an idea where we built out that network. This is the fanciest thing that's going to happen in the presentation today. So I've told you a few things that we've done. And they're big and they're complex and they have lots of pieces. But I haven't yet answered this question for you. Why would we do all those kinds of things? It's a large, complex network. It talks to people around the world coming in from different networks on different device types and that adds a layer of complexity. So why would we make all of that effort? Why would we make this more complex? Why would we make it potentially more expensive? This is the why. The Netflix streaming service has one singular goal. We call that winning moments of truth. Now, those moments of truth is when, uh, you know, say, for instance, a family sits down on their green couch, as I'm sure you have a green couch at home, too, and you have that entertainment choice to make. And in that moment, if you pick Netflix, we win that moment of truth. Now, there are things that sometimes compete for people's entertainment time and attention. Right? There's, some people play games, other people read books. I've heard some people go outside on purpose. All of these things may compete with that. So we need to make sure that whatever we're doing, we're doing everything we can to win those moments of truth. So that's why we build a CDN. That's why we make sure we could serve a customer from any part in the world, no matter what's going on. Because there's something else about those moments of truth. They're fleeting. If we're not available or we don't have content that you want to watch, or we, don't, we can't use the device that you have in your hand at the moment or that you want to use, that moment of truth is gonna go away. So everything I talked to you about today, you'll see is in service of winning those moments of truth. 
So I would love to dive in with you with all of the technology that it takes to make Netflix work, but reInvent is only a week long. So we've had to reduce that to a smaller set. So we're going to uh, run through a few interesting highlights of some of the technology that makes up your particular Netflix experience. Imagery is an important part of entertainment. If you think about it, if you've seen the Netflix, uh, the Netflix UI, there's images there. Think about books that you've read. There's images on the front, right? If you go to movies, there are movie posters, right? There are concert posters. Imagery gets used in a lot of places. And it gets used in a lot of places for a very particular reason. We're very wired for images. We are visual creatures. So much so that your eyes and your brain do really, really interesting things with images. If you imagine, say, some of the slides that you've seen so far, how long do you think you'd have to see that slide before your brain has processed it? You potentially understand what it's about, and maybe you've made a decision about it. 100 milliseconds. Recent MIT study proved that people could identify, recall, understand, and make decisions about an image they saw for a tenth of a second. Now, things get a little stranger when we start to show you multiple images. The study further proved that some people could process, understand, store, and make decisions about images that they saw for as little as 13 milliseconds. 13 milliseconds. That's, that's shorter than the amount of time it would take electricity to get from LA to New York and avoid. That's how fast your brain processes this. That's how your eyes are set up for it. That's the proof that we are visual creatures. So with that in mind, you can see why potentially this may not be the most engaging UI for a streaming service. Now, it's functional, right? If you click on one of those links, video bits will come to you. But I don't know which movie is which, right? Ah. We're, we're, you know, we're computer science professionals. We've solved this. Right? We know that people need to be able to understand this data, and computers are going to have to understand it. So, <laughs> JSON is YAML, or YAML is JSON, right? The computers can read it, the people can read it. It's the perfect solution, right? Same thing, this would also not be very engaging. Now, while you may be able to understand it and parse it as we talked, we're visual creatures. So if we take a look at this uh, shot of the service, it didn't take you long, whether you realized it or not, for your eyes and your brain to quickly scan this, understand it, get an idea about the parts of it, and potentially even start making some decisions about it. All right? there's some content here, there's some words listed with it, evidently liberal treatment of the Netflix logo because we're worried you're gonna forget what you're looking at. Uh, but you get an idea what those pieces of content are, the style from the colors or the people or the imagery that's used. And your brain did that for you very, very quickly. Now, some of you may be thinking, Dave, we understand user interface elements. Are you really making a big deal about box shots? To which I would respond, thank you for your input. Um, we've established imagery is important. Uh, and we've seen that we use a lot of it in our UI. But there's a question that we haven't asked yet. When we show you a picture, which picture do we use? You see, for the longest time, the way imagery was done with entertainment is before it was released, a group of creative professionals would do different treatments. They'd create different images and decide what that communicated or what that emoted or what that meant, and if that was attractive to the kind of audience that they were targeting. And we would go through this process, and we would pick it, and we'd print it on things, and we'd send it out. And really, you just kind of had to hope you got it right. Because the only input that you had from that process was sales of your product. And it's hard to tell, did we sell well because I picked a good image? Did we not sell well because I picked a bad image? And the only way to change that was to do some kind of reissue, right? That's why we do director's cuts, so that we can update the stuff we print on the boxes, right? So the shots we used on the boxes were done that way for a long time. And in older versions of the Netflix UI, we did exactly the same thing. We either garnered or uh, gathered this, uh, this input from the people who produced the content, or we did it ourselves, and we thought about it, and we picked one, and we put it out there, and we let it be. This was a tried and true method that had worked for advertising, for entertainment, for literally decades. However, 
Uh, Netflix, there's a little bit of the uh, doing things differently kind of in our DNA. Um, the entire company was launched on the idea of like maybe you don't want to drive down the street to pick up your DVD. The streaming uh, uh, service was launched on the idea of maybe you don't want to wait for the DVD to show up in the mail. And then things like uh, how about we release all the episodes at once so you don't even have to wait a week for all that stuff to come up. So doing things differently is, is very much about how we've thought about things. So if we go back to the screen again, let me tell you a little bit more about it. Everything on this screen is personalized for every profile of our 150 some million accounts every day. That includes not only what's picked in the rows and what goes into the rows, but also the ordering. So we've tried to pick things we think you'll like, and I hope I show you an image that will help you engage with something that I hope you like. But remember, I got milliseconds and you're gonna make that decision. So I need to make sure that I've given you the best representative information for you for that particular title so you can decide if that's something you'd like to see. So what we had to do is we had to move on beyond box shots. We had to move on past that singular idea of printing something and sending it out into the world. So for instance, here you can see a collection of uh, Stranger Things assets. And you get an idea that they're designed to communicate different things. Some of them prominently feature some of the, uh, some of the main characters. Others have some of that iconic scenery and setting and colors that Stranger Things is known for. Some, uh, for some people, it's just the iconic uh, font tree, right? So now I have all of these, right? Which one do I choose to show to you? So for a while, we started with a good old multi-armed bandit algorithm, right? So the idea of this multi-armed bandit is if you had a lot of one-armed bandits, how would you pick which one would win? And the idea of multi-armed bandit algorithms is that we want to be able to understand after each pull where our most likely win gets to, right? So you do that for a while. I show different people different images. That's our arm pull. And I get an idea which ones are winning. But there's an essential problem with multi-armed banded algorithms. They're designed to find the single best winning condition. However, what may be attractive to me for Stranger Things may not be attractive to you for Stranger Things. So while we found a globally performant image, there's a lot of people that weren't getting the best Netflix experience and we weren't winning those moments of truth. So while this helped some, we had to move on past this. What if we could uh, stir a little bit of context into the algorithm? Let's say, for instance, I know uh, that you enjoy romance movies and romantic comedies. Well, maybe for Goodwill Hunting, I want to highlight for you the fact that there's a love story component of Goodwill Hunting. Maybe if I know that you enjoy more comedic presentations, I wanted to let you know that Robin Williams is part of the story. Right? So, multi arm banded, a little bit of context, right? We're going to take a little bit of machine learning, a little bit of batch learning, we're going to stir it all together, and I get the perfect answer, right? No. There's a lot more factors at play. And remember, we need to win those moments of truth. So we're personalizing the rows, and we're personalizing the contents of the rows, and then we can start personalizing images. So we're already a few layers into a closed loop system. So some of the challenges we have, there can be only one. Anyone who appreciated the Highlander reference, thank you, feel free to applaud. Thank you. I was worried that one was gonna just die. So the first challenge is that there can be only one. I only get to show you one of those stranger thing shots, right? When you come in, I have to pick one. Now, I could show you 12, right? We saw that I have 12. We have a lot more, but I, you know, I showed you nine or 12. But if I just displayed that and filled the screen up with that, right, that would be at best confusing and at worst, frankly, a disservice to my customers. And what we're trying to do in this is to understand the influence of a particular piece of artwork and how it causes our customers to engage. So we also have the challenge that there can be only one this time. So we've discussed now a little bit about picking the right piece of art, but what's the impact if the algorithm picks a different piece of art, right? You come in once, I show you Stranger Things item number 41, the next time you come in, I, <clears throat> pardon me, I show you number 74. Does that help? Does showing you more images over time help? Does it cause some confusion? Right? I remember this one from last time, I came back to watch it, now it's not here. 
or maybe you've seen five of them now and you decide to watch it. Was it really the fifth one that did that? Or, or was it the third one that you remembered? It's hard to tell exactly what influences. Another challenge, we have lots of titles on that screen. If the algorithm decides that you appreciate seeing a focus on the main character, if I applied that to everything I showed on the screen, it would look like Netflix was a series of mugshots. Not the kind of experience that we're going for. So not only do I have to consider that personalized image for that piece of content, I also have to consider what, is it, what are the images I'm picking for all of the other ones that are around it. Because if I address them all the same way, if I give them the same treatment, it's going to become blasé. So now it's even more complicated. I have to pick the right image for you in combination with these other images. There's also a testing cost. Every time that we engender one of these A-B tests to see you know, which, which one of these algorithms might work better, there's a testing cost to that because it takes time to find a winner, which means during that time, some of our customers aren't getting the best possible Netflix experience. So remember those fleeting moments of truth? Running a test for a few weeks, a lot of those are gonna go away. So if I give you a picture of testing cost, it kind of looks like this. Traditionally, you would collect data. You'd use that data to train a model. There's some amount of time in there where you decide, okay, the model's ready to go and we have to update these different services and pieces and get it ready to go, and then we send it out and we test algorithm A against algorithm B. We find a winner and then we roll out the results. Our problem here is that x-axis. You see time continues to march along while we're learning things. So if we assume B1 in this case, this entire green area is filled with regret, right? All the customers that weren't getting the best possible Netflix during that time while we figured stuff out were in here. And that isn't what we want. So we had to move forward off of those multi-arm bandit um, algorithms because we want to reduce this regret, this green area, to zero as much as possible. So the current technique is what we call continuous contextual multi-arm bandits. Now this is an online algorithm. So that means that we do not wait to gather data. We do not batch it up. We do not do calculations. This is a continually learning model. And it'll run continuously. It'll use the context of you as a customer, which also changes to try to provide you the best possible image in combination with those other images on the screen with the goal of reducing that regret time as close to zero as possible. But there's still a little bit more. We've talked about picking images, but we also said humans are visual creatures. There's a lot more going on in that UI than just imagery, right? So what else can I do to help give your brain hints about things, whether those are selections or possibilities or options or whatever they might be? So for, uh, for instance, uh, our kid's UI is very character-oriented. So here's Bot's Baby with a couple of different treatments that may be used on the screen to give a hint about what's going on on the screen, whether that's a selection or a highlight or an attention grab, right? Little visual hints that our brains interpret well. Another example here with Black Mirror Bandersnatch is one of our interactive titles where you get to kind of pick what happens in the story. You'll notice there's a little game controller icon up there at the top, and that lets the person knowing that the device they're, they're watching on right now can participate in the interactive game. Take that a step further. I know where you left off in the Great British Baking Show and that there have been new episodes, so for your account, for this profile, I want to put that little bit on there and say, hey, there's new episodes here. So, you may be thinking, so the answer is why don't we just generate the graphics, pop them out to the CDN, problem solved. Same astute audience member as earlier. It's a good answer, we started here. This is how we started doing all of these kinds of things. We generated lots of treatments for all the different titles in different sets of graphics, in different languages, in different sizes, in different orientations. So if you kind of start to think about the math that makes that up, we have all of the possible image treatments for each title, all of the languages for that particular title, all of the different sizes and layouts for all of the different devices and UIs, and all the visual treatments. We end up with billions of images. And uh, we're pretty sure that that's the answer because that's what we used to do. And uh, if you can imagine if we had to go through and say regenerate something in our entire catalog, how long this might take. This is a months long process. 
and decided there had to be a better way. So, enter dynamization. So, dynamization is the result of a lot of teams at Netflix looking to solve this problem of both the time that it takes to make those images, uh, as well as the ability to understand what we need to make when. So now we have nearly limitless options for presenting visual data. So if we go back to that great British baking show, now you can see I can layer a few things together to create that resulting image. And that can be based on recipes, data, context, time of day, viewing history. All of those things can go together. Now you may be thinking, okay, so a new thing comes out, you make a few graphics. This still doesn't seem like a big deal. Why would we go to all of this effort? Well, imagine what it might be like if your company decides to change the logo treatment. And that logo treatment appears on every one of those billions of images. And each one of those billions of images will have to be regenerated and verified. Sometimes we have to go back to the source, the people that provided us the image, because they burned that in initially. Um, that takes a little while. The last time we had to do uh, our entire catalog before dynamization showed up, it took about seven weeks. And that time delay and that pain is actually what led to this. So that images service that makes all of this stuff happen in the background, that mixes those recipes together and provides you that information, that result of dynamization, runs millions of RPS. At peak during the day, when we got a lot of people watching, we can be running 20 million RPS just to serve you images to make up your UI. That uh, process where we had to go through and redo the whole catalog, the next time we had to do that, instead of it taking seven weeks, it took about 20 minutes, and most of that was verifying that it only took us that long. Here's another neat one on this immediate feedback. There's a challenge that a lot of designers are up against is that they design something and you know, they're professionals and they think it comes out pretty well, but really what they need to do is be able to see it within the UI so they can now actually see their changes live in their version of the Netflix UI and be able to make tweaks and changes and adjust things to those recipes so that it really looks right by the time it comes to you. Also a lot less waste. Now that we're just using the components and dynamically compositing them together, I don't have really very much visual information I'm not using. When we used to have those billions of images, a large number of them, for whatever reason, would never be used. So we'll move on from imagery to network traffic because that seems like a logical topical change. So all of these images, we have to get them to you somehow, right? And there can be a lot of internet between my customers and uh, you know, the stuff that I'm allowed to control. So if we look at it from the customer side of things, there's still this last mile challenge. Because after all, if for whatever reason my customers can't get their network packets to me or get them to me quickly or reliably, they don't experience a good Netflix experience. Again, moments of truth, right? That's my goal, I gotta win those things. So a few scenarios to consider. Here's the happy path scenario. I have a customer who can connect out of their ISP's network through one of many uh, drain points that are not congested and get that traffic out to AWS. There's an Open Connect appliance or set of appliances set up inside the network. They can talk to those. They can connect out via the backbone to other things, right? This is the happy path. What's the one thing we know that's true of any happy path scenarios? They hardly ever happen. So this is the reality, right? That there's some congestion or there's a problem you know, maybe some fiber got trenched somewhere, and now this net, uh, pardon me, now this ISP's remaining networks are, are rather congested. And we can't get our packets out to, uh, out to AWS quickly enough. Now, I'm not saying that ISP's do this on purpose or they're bad at their jobs, but this is a reality, right? There's a different wave of time and need and pressure on those networks. However, ultimately, my customer doesn't care. I want to press play and see the video bits, right? So that's the problem we have to solve. So what if we could do this? What if in those situations I could take my customer's traffic and I could run it across that backbone that I control and get those requests to AWS that way? Because then my customers would still have that good experience. They could still surf around in the app and do what they wanted to do. And as long as I do this in the background without them having to know, all my customers have is a good experience. So, we thought that sounded like a pretty good idea, so we thought we'd go through the process of seeing what it took to make that happen. So we built four different modes 
for the way for our customers now to connect to our services at AWS. Mode number one, happy path. It happens occasionally. They go right out their ISP's network. They connect to AWS without a problem. Mode number two, they connect to one of our OCA appliances at an internet exchange somewhere close by, and their traffic then goes across our backbone to AWS. Mode number three, there's an OCA inside their network that they can use. They connect there. They go via my, Mac, via my backbone to AWS. And occasionally, mode number four, where they have to go to a local OCA, go down to an IX OCA, and then they can jump on the backbone and go from there. So now I've showed you four modes or four additional complex things I've added into your Netflix experience. So what are the advantages of us doing that? Well, one of the first ones, uh, there's some simple reliability right there, right? We're providing an alternative if our, typical path, um, if our typical path doesn't work for us. But that also means we have to add some complexity in there, right? I'm going to have to monitor those paths constantly and figure out which ones are going to be the best for you to use at any given time. Now, I can tell you, we've done this, and we've proven it saves some moments of truth. So it works, but let's dig into it a little bit further. So here's a picture, very typical network experience, right? Three-way handshake. We have the TLS negotiation, which I've always found to be very polite, right? The clients and the servers saying hello to each other as they exchange a little bit of data, right? They get all of that negotiated, and then finally the HTTP request can go through. In this scenario, time to first byte, 400 milliseconds. Not terrible, right? That's not really bad. It's not great, but it's not horrible. But what if I could change that a little bit by dropping one of those appliances closer to you? This conversation now looks like this. You're now doing most of your setup and negotiation with an appliance that's much more close to you. And your only long haul connection is that HTTP response. In this example, time to first byte almost in half, 220 milliseconds instead. So that's pretty good. That's kind of a nice boon. I make things a couple hundred milliseconds faster. That seems like a lot of complexity for a couple hundred milliseconds here or there. So what are some other things that it does for us? That last mile is tricky. Lots of different networks, lots of different things going on, lots of wireless neighbor, uh, net networks and neighborhoods completely fighting with each other, right? A lot of things that go on there. So a very typical thing that happens is TCP loss, right? That happens. It's regular. It's normal. The spec is built to recover from it. The challenge is it takes one full round trip time in order to determine if there's a problem, and at best, one and a half round trip times to fix that problem. Which means while that repair is going on, the application is not receiving any data that it needs. We've effectively stalled as far as our customer can tell. So if I can shorten the window in which that TCP loss and renegotiation may happen, right, from that 100 milliseconds, maybe down to like 30 milliseconds or something like that. Now, something I know is going to happen, so I'd love to tell you we've solved the last mile problem, but not quite. Um, I'm at least reducing the impact from something I know will happen. So I make that better for the clients. Now on that OCI, OCA side of things, it already has an established connection with AWS, so there's no connection set up there. And we can run, we can multiplex all of these different uh, customers through that same connection. So it means overall there's better resource utilization, there's less idling happening, it means we have a much better chance of keeping congestion windows high so that we're keeping things flowing, we get out of the box header compression, and we don't get uh, that uh, uh, head of line blocking at the HTTP layer. So by adding that complexity, we've added reliability, speed, and repairability to every customer connection that comes in. So that's a little bit about um, the system itself. What about some of the things that it takes to make those systems? What are some of the things that our engineers use on a regular basis to make all of this work for you? One of the first things is Spinnaker. Spinnaker is uh, our continuous integration, continuous delivery platform that we use for lots of things around Netflix. It started early on as, a, as an earlier product for providing kind of a single pane of glass and an operational management view because we had challenges with the console. It's grown enormously since then. Now not only does it deploy virtually every microservice at Netflix, those OCAs, there's a firmware for those things, we deploy that firmware with this. We deploy other applications with this. So this has become an extremely powerful tool. Something else that I kind of like about it is that you can have it too. Uh, it was given to the uh, Cloud Native Foundation about a year ago, and uh, Spinnaker.io available for you to use and will always be available for you to use. So let's talk a little bit about it. 
I mentioned we have that microservices environment. Um, that's only a portion of the solution. Just architecting microservices doesn't give you all of the hopes and dreams that maybe you thought microservices would solve for you. So let's, let's walk through a little scenario. Let's imagine this is a microservices environment. Let's imagine that that large dot in the middle is maybe some key important service um, for your Netflix experience. For instance, maybe you can't log in if it doesn't exist or you can't make selections or search. Um, perhaps it coordinates communication between some other services or makes certain data available other services need. Now, uh, imagine it has some creative name like API. At this point, you can stop imagining because that's exactly what we have. Now, in years past, um, this very important system run by very capable software engineers with excellent operational habits would deploy the service about every two weeks. And it was a constantly busy two weeks, right? They're coordinating with dependents and dependencies. They're testing their own code. They're doing verifications. They're making sure they're keeping the promises that they've made. And then they deploy once every two weeks. That's a very safe operation, right? They're making a lot of effort. They're taking the time. But in doing so, there are ripple effects. So again, I mentioned we have, a, we have a microservices environment, which means there are other people involved. Those other teams oftentimes aren't running something as massive as that centralized API service. So what are they doing during that meantime? Right? They have a current code set that they're using for the current set of API that maybe they need to, they need to be able to hot patch. They got this new version that they're working with the API team to test and make sure that it has what they need. But now they have some extra time, right? They're waiting for this deployment to happen. So what do we do? We work on new features, and we create more code sets that we, now we have to manage. So while we had a microservices environment, we inadvertently created some pretty heavy coupling between those systems. And the coupled system moves at the slowest part. So we had lots of systems waiting on each other, testing against each other, and lots of teams managing different code sets. So in reality, my, my, my pretty uh, ripple effects picture is a lot more like this, right? People are still making changes. They're still making their own local decisions. And what we have is lots of ripples now that are crashing into each other. And the way that we try to keep those crashes from impacting our customers so we continue to win those moments of truth is that we have those high coordination costs, right? Everyone's lining up to perform the deployment ritual. We had more code sets to manage. It took us more time. This all resulted in a lack of flexibility. And flexibility is one of those promises that we kind of wanted from this microservices idea. So we also get a slowdown. And something else happens with that slowdown. We're not getting as much work done. So oftentimes, what do we do? We add resources. Well, now there's a lot of work in different stages, so those added resources go into managing this complex system and this highly coordinated system instead of actually creating new features. Spinnaker was our answer to that. So some ideas of what it looks like and how we answered that issue. So here's one screenshot, kind of gives you an idea of an operational pane of glass. It's a view of different, uh, different API deployments running in different parts of the world in different clusters. You get an idea how large that cluster is, how small that cluster is, and its health at a quick glance. So now, uh, we're not necessarily waiting to figure out, is an instance okay? Is it healthy? Did the scaling happen like it was supposed to? I don't know. Let me go check the logs. Do we have pings coming back? What does the monitoring system say, right? We get a nice, quick visual check-in. There's an important part of that. What we want to make sure is when we deploy, deploy is very rarely take code set and put it in the cloud, right? Put the, you know, put the cloud, put the appy thing in the cloudy thing, right? It doesn't really work that way. Right, there's a lot of things we want to have happen every time. We want to make sure those assets are built the same way, the images are made the same way, stuff comes in from the right place, certain testing is done, right? So deployment is not a simple thing. It's very complex and it's very important. By being able to encode that in a pipeline, we move that uh, complexity of management off to the computers because they really like following lists and checking things no matter if they're tired, no matter if it's a holiday, no matter if it's been a tough week, no matter if this is a really large code push. So we get a lot of consistency in behavior. Something else that I like, you know, I'm, I'm part of the reliability team. So the fact that any team can easily create canary analysis as part of their deployments is, is kind of a favorite of mine. So we're actually able to drop in to that, uh, to that deployment pipeline a little note that says, hey, why don't you put a few of these out there? We'll call it, a, I don't know, a canary. 
and we'll have it take some production traffic, right? Because while testing is good, it doesn't you know, really matter until it encounters your customers, right? So I have a little bit of traffic going to the canary, but what I want you to do is I want you to match and test its behaviors against the current running version. And unless it meets or exceeds or pass these, passes these tests or does what I expect, I want you to stop it right there. So now we, uh, we don't run into all of these problems of, well, you know, the code looked good and test and everything felt right and we did the correct rituals and we, got, and we had eggs on Wednesday morning like we're supposed to every time we deploy, but for some reason it didn't work, right? Now we get a very capable, complex testing system built in for people. It's really very phenomenal. However, it has a lot of details to manage. As it is, those teams that own that software have to understand the detail of how their operation work, or how their uh, software operates, how their application behaves, how it talks to other systems, its dependence and its dependencies. They also have to know how it wires into all of these AWS primitives that they need to know. They have to know the details, they have to understand what to put together, what works right now and what doesn't, how to wire those things together. Now I can happily say I have very capable engineers that are good at this but this is a lot of sharp edges for people to manage and manage regularly and manage often. So what we wanna do is see if we can remove some of those sharp edges that people need to manage. So we wanna change the way we think about this. We've built a lot of good tools, we have a lot of nice pieces, but we wanna change the construction. So we have a new concept called managed delivery. And we believe that managed delivery is going to make a lot of fundamental changes for our application owners to make their lives easier without reducing the quality of their software delivery. A couple of important pieces. First one called declarative infrastructure. The idea here is that we want application owners to focus on requirements instead of details of primitives. Right now people are selecting uh, particular instance types right, uh, this kind of connectivity, this kind of load balancing stuff, because, oh, this one's on the internet, this one's a private one, right? Again, it's a lot of details to manage. However, with declarative infrastructure, they can just provide requirements. I need this kind of CPU, I need this amount of memory, I need this kind of storage, this is gonna be a, a, a publicly available service or a private service. And then, we can allow the platform teams to move around underneath them, because now we have a set of requirements. And both sets of people outsource the details of the steps to the Spinnaker application. So now we've created less cognitive load for engineering teams, and we've created a lot more freedom for people, pardon me, responsible for infrastructure. Second half of declarative delivery is that we want people to focus on flow. So as I mentioned earlier, those pipelines are a good idea. And you can describe exactly what you want to have happen. But again, that's a lot of cognitive load. And let's be honest, that's not how we really think about software deployment as we go through the stages, right? If we think about, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop this out to, uh, to, the de uh, to the development environment, and then I wanna run some security scans on it, make sure I haven't done anything silly or forgotten something important. And if all that stuff goes on, then you know, we pop it over to the test environment. We run all of, our, all of our tests and our integration tests and other people can test along with us. Maybe we run a canary in there to make sure there are no little surprises. And then if all of that goes well, then go ahead and send that thing out to production as long as it passes the canary test and these other things. As honestly, that's how we think about software deployments. So now with uh, declarative delivery, our application teams are able to think about it that way. Some interesting things about Spinnaker. We do thousands of deployments to our production environment every day. I used to have a really fun number to share, but after we got above about 4,000, the team responsible for it told me to stop worrying about it. We run about uh, 50,000 pipelines every day. Those pipelines run millions of tasks. And it's done some nice things for us. We're able to deploy more quickly, more easily, more reliability, so, or more reliably, so what do we do? We deploy smaller code sets. What does deploying smaller code sets allow you to do? It allows you to more easily logic about the state and the behavior of your software. So what does that do? That makes us all much more reliable because now I have fewer surprises to worry about. As a real world example, if we go back to that, uh, that fictitious, very real API, uh, API service I told you about, once they adopted Spinnaker, they went from deploying once every two weeks with kind of a grand ritual to running a nightly canary and doing a daily deploy of one of the largest single services at Netflix. 
and the reliability of the service overall went up. Pretty powerful. Let's move on to observability. Observability describes your system's ability to explain to you what it's doing and why. It gives you reasoning to take action or can kick off some automation. It's a large, complex topic with lots of blog posts and products and options, and that's good because it's an important thing. Uh, from a reliability standpoint, observability is one of the cornerstones of reliable and resilient systems. It lays the groundwork for good and healthy automation. It's important, it's impactful, but it's also complex. Something to understand about complex systems. As complexity increases, your comprehension of that system decreases. Large, complex systems run by large, complex organizations have a multiplier that makes this go even faster. So knowing that we had systems like this, that we had large, complex systems changing quickly, we needed better operational insight that could go along with that speed. Now, metrics are often an answer. Metrics are a good answer. We run about five billion time series every minute that we collect, aggregate, and publish. So metrics are good, but they do have a requirement. If you're going to have an effective metric, you need to have something for which you can reduce your comprehension to a number. Now, that fits for a lot of things, but there are a lot of other things it doesn't fit for. And the default behavior for a lot of those other things has been, we'll put it in a log file. And then we get into scaling problems, right? As soon as I go from 10 to hundreds to thousands of machines, which log am I going to look at? Oh, I'll aggregate my logs and I'll put them into a management system. I think we all know where that goes, right? It becomes complex. It becomes yet another system to manage and another problem to solve. So when we decided that we needed to tackle this differently for Netflix, we decided that there were four important factors here that we needed to make sure we conquered. First of all, we wanted something where we would not have to limit information. For instance, if we go back to metrics again, I'm reducing whatever that complex situation or representation is down to a number. Had to be fast. We had large, complex systems. And I've shown you just a few of those run millions of RPS all of the time. Broad coverage was going to be important. Because we don't always know the questions that we're going to have to ask of our systems. When that new black swan event shows up and we're trying to figure out what caused it, by nature, I don't understand it. So therefore, I could not have necessarily planned the right data to provide me the insight that I needed. Finally, it had to be cost effective. Uh, it's tough to uh, convince a corporate entity that your observability system should cost 10 times more than your product. So those are our four important things. So we built a little system called Mantis. As you can see, it uh, has one of our most colorful logos. Mantis has been in use at Netflix now for about five years or so. Essentially, it's an operational event streaming and processing system as a service. It's a robust, scalable platform that's really designed for high volume, low latency use cases like anomaly detection and alerting, and allows your developers to focus on their business logic, knowing that they can gain insights later. So how does it answer those four things? So don't limit information. An application should be free to publish every single event and we should not transform that information because if we transform it now, we transform it prematurely, we lose some of the information that may be vital to what people need. It also needs to be fast. We want it to be as real time as possible. So we process each one of those events as they come in and make them available. It's because a lot of these operational problems are time sensitive by nature. One example, you press play on your device at home. A lot of things happen at Netflix. Our customers do that thousands of times a second. If there's an impact to our customers, every second that goes by where there's a problem, one of those fleeting moments of truth, or thousands of them go away. So we needed an insight system that could keep up with that particular speed. So for broad coverage, be able to ask any of those particular questions so we don't early transform, we don't change information, we take every event that we want you to publish and we make it available. Ah, but cost effective. How do we take the fact that any application can publish any number of events all the time because we ask them to and have that not, not kill us financially, right? So we've done a few different things there. A lot of the use cases that people are using Mantis for use the same data set. So those different jobs can discover each other and they can collaborate and share their own results. So now we've enriched more data and used less data computation so by effectively maximizing reuse. 
Uh, Mantis itself also uses uh, on-demand reactive model, so there's really no cost to publishing those events until you subscribe to, a screen, uh, subscribe to a stream for those particular events. So it gives people the freedom to just throw whatever they want to at the system, but then there's only an impact when they actually ask questions. It's really great. They can publish whatever event with whatever set of data they want, knowing that if they need to ask a question later on they hadn't thought of, that they can do that. So that's what Mantis has done. It's, it solves some real problems for us. I mentioned there's, the, uh, there's this little you know, Netflix streaming service that people press play on thousands of times a second. Uh, we're able to keep a good uh, pulse on the health of that entire streaming system with those hundreds of microservices and the effect that it's actually having on our customers via Mantis and know about issues in seconds. Now, because so much data goes through there, the alerts or the notifications that come in are heavily contextualized because the system realizes there's all of this related data, which is great, right? There's a, there's a lot of problems with alerting. There's the fire alarm versus the smoke problem, right? A fire alarm tells me there is an issue. Smoke tells me where the problem might be. That's what the contextual alerting does for us. It identifies what the problem is and places where that problem may exist. For our cloud database engineering teams, uh, they use Cassandra health checks via the Mantis system because they're able to analyze lots of rich events and lots of different data sources in real time to generate a holistic picture of the behavior of that particular instance node, cluster, or data set. Chaos experimentation is something that Netflix does a lot of. We invest heavily in chaos engineering because it's extremely effective. Now, we've learned in the past when we were running chaos experiments that occasionally what we learn is that we've impacted our customers negatively. That still happens, right? I love to think that we're perfect, but that doesn't always happen. But if I can use a nearly real-time system and I realize that I have a chaos uh, um, experiment running that's causing problems, I can clean that up in seconds as opposed to minutes or potentially hours. Another interesting use is personally identifiable information detection. It can happen where some kind of PII data leaks into a log file accidentally. Somebody has some information they don't realize they have and they drop it to a log to figure out what's going on. We've taught Mantis to recognize those patterns and it'll identify as soon as that leak happens so that we can go take care of it. So that's what Mantis has done. Mantis has been open sourced, so now you can use it too. A lot of the software that I've mentioned, you can find at uh, netflix.github.io. It's available for you to use. Many of them have very, very rich communities. So they're always changing, they're always growing, they're always becoming more effective. So thank you. If you enjoyed the presentation, please complete the survey. It provides valuable information both to AWS and to your reInvent speakers. If you did not enjoy the talk, perhaps filling out surveys is not for you. <laughs> I'm kidding, everybody should fill out the survey.